Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Milton Regional Councillor Samira Ali. Situated in southern Ontario, the town of Milton is located just under an hour's drive from Kitchener, Waterloo, Hamilton, and even, yes, Toronto. While Go Transit provides easy service to Milton itself, the surrounding region is most easily explored by car or even motorcycle. From its fairs, barns, and markets to locally owned shops and bistros, you'll be sure to find elements of 19th century charm in and around Milton. The town even houses Ontario's longest operating blacksmith shop, still in its original location. The nearby Niagara Escarpment offers amazing hiking trails with stunning lookouts and breathtaking vistas. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Milton Regional Councillor Samira Ali. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Much appreciated for taking time out of your day and your schedule to sit down with me and talk about yourself and talk about the great community of Milton, Ontario. Before we get started and we before we dive into the crux of the interview, I've got to start with the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception to this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Samira? <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris, for having me on your show. I've been following your show for a long time now, and I've always imagined myself sitting next to you having this chat. Uh, it truly is a dream come true. I'm not going to lie. Um, and uh, coming back to your question, um, I wouldn't say this was something that I've always wanted to do, but I will say that I've always wanted to be in service. Um, it could have been police, it could have been firefighter. Um, I've always wanted to be in service. And that was my passion, even as a little girl. Um, I do have a master's degree in uh, political science and international relations. And that kind of, you know, activated the bug in me a little bit. So I got interested in reading the news, uh, following politics um, internationally and locally as well. And uh, it's been 21 years I moved to Canada. And uh, as soon as I became Canadian, I wanted to get involved in the local politics here as well, uh, which, of course, made me uh, go out volunteer for candidates um, with various uh, parties, uh, not just one party. Um, and uh, when I moved to Mississauga, Sue McFadden, great counselor from Ward 10 Mississauga, was my counselor. And there were some issues in my neighborhood that I reached out to her for. And she was super helpful and very inspiring. And I said, you know what? This is something I could do. And uh, after that, as uh, um, luck may have it, I moved to Milton nine years ago. And um, this was a new ward where I had just moved. And uh, there were lots of growing pain issues as as they are in new subdivisions. And I was always complaining and providing options of what could happen. And many people around me started saying, well, then you should run for council, you know, put your money where your mouth is. You're always yapping about, oh my goodness, they could do this better. This roundabout sucks. 
it should be this way. Um, just a little bit of a background or my dad um, was a civil engineer. So I kind of grew up with a lot of planning, engineering language in my life, even as a child. For fun, believe it or not, our dad would just throw us in his uh, beat up old uh, truck and take us to his construction sites. And he would walk us around and show us, okay, this is asphalt, kids, and this is where the curb goes. And and then we would ask him questions like, okay, what's under the asphalt, dad? And then, so as a child, I've been very close to construction and urban planning, so to speak. And I would say it was just a natural decision for me to step into this role. Uh, but of course, the passion and the drive, as you know, it can be very thankless too, comes from um, this innate sense of serving and giving back, especially to Canada. Canada has given me a lot. The least I can do is give it back, give 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 back to the community. Um, so there's a few things I want to unpack in in that statement that you just gave there. First off, uh, you say you, you came to Canada 21 years ago. Do you mind me asking where you came from? I came from Pakistan, um, and that's where I did uh, my. Um, master's degree in international relations and political science, public policy. Um, and uh, But before that, I did, um, until my high school study in the Middle East, um, there's a country called Sultanate of Oman in a very small town there. That's where I had my early education. And uh, my master's was done in, in Pakistan, Karachi. That's where I'm from. So... I've never asked this question on the show, so you're going to be the first. So I do apologize if it's out, out of left field a little bit. Being now in your sixth, coming up to your sixth year on, on municipal council in Canada, looking back in your on your youth, did you get a sense that when you were in Pakistan or Oman, uh, Oman um, municipal politics was something you could get into or wanted to get into or was politics so far out of the realm and it wasn't until you moved to Canada that you said maybe I can see myself in that elected official like Sue Mc Councillor Sue McFadden did was uh thank you that's a great question um politics um from where I come from is not a very respectable profession just because of uh the perceived notion of Corruption and overall <laughs> politics <clears throat> and politicians are considered, you know, it's always take these words are taken into negative connotations. Yeah. Um, having said that, yes, the answer is yes. When I moved to Canada is when I thought that this would be something I could look into. It's considered very respect respectable and it's something where it's so, is a place where you can actually deliver results. See, that is the key. Um, I wouldn't be in politics or I would just leave politics if if I realize that, you know, I can't deliver for my community. Um, I'm in this because I want to provide solution to the community. I want to serve the community. And, and I'm really happy and glad that my husband and I chose Canada to be our home and raise our children. And, and more than that, very happy to be in Milton, Ontario. So we'll, we'll we'll turn to the role of the counselor for a second, if you don't mind. Um, you have to make some pretty tough choices around that council table. And your first four years, I should mention, were as a, and I, and I just want to try to explain this correctly, as a town counselor. And then your last two years have been as a regional counselor. So not only do you sit on the town of uh, Milton Council, but you also sit, and I always forget the region, I think it's Halton Region uh, Council as well, correct? Yes, that is okay. correct. So you now have to make some very big decisions around that council table, not only just at Milton Town Council, but as the Halton Regional Councillor as well. At the end of the day, you, as in Councillor Samira Ali, have to make those tough choices. How do you make those tough choices? How do you make those tough choices to ensure that the decisions you make impact the most people but not in a negative way? Absolutely. Great question. And I think um, I think I'm finally at a point where I can answer this question truthfully and in a way where new politicians, new elected members of council can actually learn and take away something from it. Um, 
in my experience, the best decision making is done through research. Now, the research can be the reports that staff give you. They are trained and qualified professionals who have done this for decades. And of course, um, they will give us the best advice that is also fiscally responsible to the taxpayer. Um, on the other side of this is what does the community today want? What do the residents in my ward want? Um, and so that's where the other part of the research comes in, going out in the community and asking them what do they want, trying to understand where they're coming from and where their passions lie and what, what they like, they don't like. Because end of the day, that's what they've selected me to do. Um, and then there's, I would say, a third, I would say, facet to this, and which is uh, you cannot make decisions in isolation. You have to keep your broader vision and strategic plan at the back of your mind always. You always have to look at decision making through that lens, too. Well, how, where do we see ourselves in 2051? Um, does that vision supersede a small group of residents who do not want this eight story building in this location, which is always been zoned for high density. Um, end of the day, I would say, if you look at opportunities, that is an opportunity for me to sit down with my residents, put my educator hat on and give them some education on how urban planning works um, and, uh, and what results can come out negative or positive um, in, in any kind of decision. So to, to sum it all up, the way I make my decisions is through research. A little bit of gut feeling is also involved. As a woman, I really truly do desire on my gut feeling. So I would recommend to, especially to my female colleagues anywhere serving politicians, um, Trust that gut feeling, listen to it, it knows. And, uh, and as, as, as long as you serve, you continue to serve on council, the gut feeling gets honed and sharpened more and more. And I mean, I see colleagues who have been serving on council for 20 plus years, they don't even blink an eye. And they tell me, this is what will happen. This many people will come in and delegate. And this is how council will vote. And uh, I kid you not, they are always bang on. So experience matters, but also research, research, research. Okay. Now, I want to sort of flip a little bit of that question, but that answer as well on its head. Your gut feeling is, I'm assuming from our oh, literally about 10 minute conversation so far, it seems like you speak from your heart. It seems like you have a true instinct of what your gut tells you. So therefore you're going to sort of lead with that. But you come to the realization, I would I would hazard a guess that you've come to the realization that you've been elected by the people of your ward, your region, and the people mm -hmm. of Milton. And sometimes what you hear from the people will fly in face of what you feel internally in your gut. So how do you balance your opinion with what you hear from people? Because when when I speak to municipal politicians or when I see, we all see social media, we all see the, the, oh, they didn't listen to us. So how do I know that they're actually here representing us? And we've probably all seen that on social media when it comes to the decision you've made or anyone has made. I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying in general, how do you balance what you feel with what you hear from the people? Because the people have elected you to be their voice, but at the same time, you and I know, I, I say this knowing this well, that what, where they've elected you for your values and your morals and what you pitch them at that election time. So how do you balance what you hear with how you feel? A very good question, uh, but it's got a very simple answer and a short answer. Fact of the I matter is... <laughs> Fact of the matter is, Chris, um, people who are the loudest in any community are in a very small number. And it takes experience to realize that it is the silent majority that elected you. So whenever you're going with your gut and whenever you're making the right decision that will benefit the community, not today, tomorrow, but in the next 10 years, you are in fact listening to the residents who have elected you 
They are the silent majority. Yes, there's a very small, very loud, uh, often very um, passionate uh, minority uh, that will continue to call, text, email you, will go on social media. But I have always been able to count these individuals on my two hands. And so if it goes more than two hands, yes, that is a point where I have to go on council and do what my majority of the community wants. Uh, but as, as you know, and I know, in any election, there is two, three, four candidates, and the candidate with most majority wins, which is why the candidate who wins must do what the majority wants. You talk about that silent my majority, and I agree there is a silent majority, but I don't think it's a true silent majority. I think it's an apathetic majority. And when I say that, I respectfully say that this way. There is a atmosphere, an aura around municipal politics. As long as my garbage is picked up, my water's turned on, my taxes are relatively low and and in the snow, in the winter time, as long as my snow, my roads are plowed in the snow time, I'm content with what's going on at council. Do you get a sense from your six years in office as a town councilor now as regional that people are willing to give their opinion? Those that silent majority are actually willing to engage with you when you meet them on their sort of turf and not to expect them to come to you every time that you have an issue that you want feedback from? Absolutely. So the silent majority, I won't call it apathy. I would call it satisfaction. They are satisfied. And when I have town halls, I do have a newsletter that goes out to uh, more than 3,000 uh, residents in my ward they will respond to my emails and they will chat with me. I have long chats with my residents through my newsletter emails. And uh, that's where they tell me what is working, what is not working. Mostly it's very, very respectful. It's very, very uh, constructive. I learn and I grow from that. So that is the key. I mean, anybody watching here who's an elected official, get on the newsletter game, man. It's just the best way to com communicate with your residents who really will make a, you know, a difference in making you grow. Um, and people feel safe in that, in that scenario to reach out to you with whatever opinion they have. And they're, they're emailing you from a valid email address. So, you know, it's not a troll. Um, so uh, the, the whole notion of respect, mutual respect is there. Um, and I, I really think um, even when I door knock, sometimes in the summer, I will go out and knock doors and meet people in parks um, and various events. I will speak to them and I will ask them questions that are relevant to our area. They will tell me um, and then I will educate them and they will understand. So I think it works very well. But end of the day, as uh, you might have noticed in, in, in all of the answers I'm giving you, key uh, common denominator is the fact that you have to be community connected with your community. You cannot work in isolation. You cannot say my job is just to show up to council meetings, read the agenda and make proper proper votes. No, be connected, go out, be at events, um, go out, um, uh, talk to parents when you go to your kids' soccer games or go out to local parks, speak to them. That's what I've been doing for the last six years and it's been serving you well. On the flip side of that, because I just want to, before we turn to the next question, how important is it for you to listen to all sides of the issue as well? Because we often find ourselves in those isolation silos, those social media silos that if you agree with me, I follow you. If you agree with me, I'll probably go out and grab a coffee with you. How important is it for you as a counselor when you're making those decisions to not just hear from the people who agree with you, but who hear from people who disagree with you? And when they stop you, respectfully, and I'm going to air phrase that respectfully, disagree with you. When they do, do you, do you take time to actually sit with them and say, okay, I hear you, I understand you. And then it goes back to that education piece. This is why we're doing it this way. Absolutely. It is key that we hear the residents out, silent majority or, or vocal minority or 
our vocal majority, whatever it is. Um, my job is to make sure I'm there to have that ear to them and their, and their concerns, questions, problems. My job is to find solutions. The solution could be actionable solution. The solution could be me just explaining how the process takes place. The solution could be me educating them that this is where my work stops and this is where your MPP's work starts. So um, there's lots of confusion and um, in the residents, especially new immigrants like myself, I was a new immigrant not too long ago, 21 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> uh, to understand Milton, uh, especially, but I'm gonna get very focused now on my ward. My ward is, uh, is one of the newer wards of our town and um, 40% of Milton overall are immigrants, like myself, and 50% of Milton residents are members of a visible minority, like myself. So um, education is huge for me uh, when it comes to new people to our country, to our ward, to our community, um, to, to just help them um, navigate the system, um, the Canadian system. So I really consider myself that bridge and I love what I do. How often are you dealing with provincial or federal jurisdictional questions? Because you are the closest to the people. You were at FCM, I was at FCM, and friend of the show and past president of FCM, Scott Pierce, would always call it the government of proximity, which is municipal government, which is true. You are the closest to the people. They probably know you better than they know their MPP or even yes. their MP because you're in the community 24 seven. You make a decision at Milton town council. You're at the grocery store the next morning or the day after, and they will see you MPP MP might not see them as often, but they still represent the area. How often do you get those provincial and federal jurisdictional questions and you kind of answered it already, but I want you to expand on it. How important is it for you to not just say, it's not my issue? Go talk to your MPP because they've come to you for a reason. Yes, yes. They've come to me because they've made that one-on-one -on -one connection with me already. Yeah. Uh, they know my name. I have given them my email address. I've given them my card. Uh, so that's why they've emailed me, called or texted me. And um, of course, being new, they uh, they don't understand the levels of government sometimes, um, and that's that's very common for for any immigrant from anywhere. Uh, it is my job to help them navigate the system. I uh, very easily and conveniently am able to escalate their request to to the proper level of government to the proper ministry. I've learned from experience that don't just <laughs> CC your MP or MPP, CC the ministry as well. So. I do that and I and I leave it to them and I, I share in, in, in the end of my email, I will say um, for all municipal matters, please stay in touch and reach out. I'll do whatever I can to help you. So that kind of educates them too, but also gives them the little, you know, step up they need, the uplifting they need to um, to to find out where exactly their solution lies. I want to turn to the town of Milton as a whole now. And if you've listened to the show, you can skip forward about 15 seconds because I'm about to go into a preamble here. This conversation mm -hmm. is between the regional councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and her opinion alone. That being said, this may line up with some of the issues that are going on in front of or challenges that are going on in Milton, but at the end of the day, it's still her opinion. Uh, with that being said, if you're about to send me emails, I will forward them to the counselor herself so that way she can answer them. With that being said, now, counselor, in your opinion, which I already know what the answer is going to be because we we talked about it a little bit at FCM, but I want you to talk about it a little bit more in depth so we can go back and forth on it. In your opinion, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the town of Milton today as of recording this episode? Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, the town of Milton, just to give you a little bit of a perspective, in the last 20 years have gro has grown from 30,000 residents 
to 150,000 residents. Now, with that, obviously, come growing pains. What are those growing pains? It could be infrastructure. It could be uh, making sure that the taxes stay low. It could be zoning appropriate growth where it belongs um, and many, many more issues. But I would say, and I, I believe and I stand firm on this notion and fact that we actually have done a very good job of making sure that our growth and our infrastructure match each other to the best of our ability. Now, the reason I say the best of our ability is because um, it's the, the age old question of chicken or the egg, right? Do we provide infrastructure first before growth happens? But the cost of that has to be bared by the current population through taxes. So there, there's the, the question of fairness there. Do we do that or do we wait for the population to come and those taxpayers who are going to use their, those amenities and facilities to be in Milton so that we can start building them? Building them? That is one of the biggest challenge every single fast growing community in GDA faces and we face it too. Um, another challenge we had while we were expanding so fast was uh, making sure that we have post-secondary education. We saw a vision for Milton till 2051 where we knew a lot of our population will be very young. We knew that the kind of location and economic development we provide will attract a lot of not only immigrants, but really highly educated immigrants. Now, fact of the matter is, and I, my family is an example of that, when you draw in highly educated residents, there is a big chance, and history has proven it, that they want their children to be highly educated too. So which is why to create a complete community, it is imperative, it was imperative for us to have a university. And 20 years ago, our town started that planning process to have university lands allocated for us in Milton. Um, I'm happy to share those lands are in my ward. They are called the Milton Education Village. We have Laurier and Conestoga coming there and Schlegel Villages is already under construction there. So it's going to be its own little subdivision with its high schools, elementary schools, university, homes, and 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 any other amenity that is required in a subdivision. So that's how we have planned so far. That's how we have been overcoming the challenges we have uh, with uh, the comple completion of our post-secondary um, uh, planning. We now anticipate a lot of growth and demand for transit, which is I will be the first person to say over the years have been neglected severely by this town, by various councils, including my council. And now that we are at that level of, you know, justifying the business case of this demand, we are heavily, this term of council is heavily focused on fixing the transit issue, making sure that we lay out the proper routes and the network required to keep people moving around, especially students who are going to come to us in hundreds of numbers. Okay, so there's a few questions I want to ask to follow up with that. So, transit's a must. Uh, Milton just went through a provincial by-election where there's a lot of issues on that council table, or on, the, on that provincial debate stage, I should say. And one of them that I heard, and I was in Calgary and I heard that, but I'm one of those keen observers who likes to actually listen to these things, um, mm -hmm. was the ghost go train. Would there yeah. be access to the GO train to Milton? I had the pleasure to visit Milton last summer. I stopped in for a few hours and I do toured the downtown and it seemed like it was a hopping place. Do you get a sense that the provincial government, and I'm not trying to, I should should just clarify here for a second. Um, so just to be aware that the councillor did run in the last provincial election, not in the by-election, but in the provincial election in 2022 for a party that was not the governing party at the time and still not the governing party. Uh, I just want to make sure that's on the table before I ask this political question. 
Um, do you get a sense that the provincial government is coming to the table to try and help with those transit issues to ensure that Milton is connected to other parts of the GTH, GTAH, or however they call it today? Because when it was when I was there, it was when I worked at Queens Park, it was the GTA. So <laughs> I don't know what it's called now. <laughs> uh, no, uh, um, so it is imperative that we have an all day two way go service. 30% of Milton's current population is under the age of 19 years old. Okay, 30%, that's a big Wait, number. 30? That's... 30, 30, 30%. Did not know that. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's approximately 50,000 people. Okay, because we are a population of 150,000. So 50,000 people need to go to work. Uh, these are people who are 19 and under. So you would say most of them are also university going youngsters and young adults. Um, of course, we need to move these people to where they want to go most efficiently and most sustainably, might I add. And of course, all day two-way go service plays a big role in that. Um, I am very hopeful that with our new MPP, who was my colleague on council uh, and has served on our town council for 12 years, uh, will make a huge difference because he understands uh, the pressures we face. He has, um, I would say, currently three university going children himself faces the exact issues that I face. I have two university going children now. And uh, I am very hopeful with him being there that we have a very solid chance of getting some results on this file. End of the day though, the province can want to do whatever they want. It's Metrolinx that has to budge. And unfortunately, Metrolinx has not been very cooperative with us. Um, our mayor, our, our CAO council as a whole has sent many letters many letters to them, to the province, and it's always, you know, the passing the buck kind of game happening at that level. Uh, but I'm really hopeful that our new MPP will make a difference. Um, while we're on the topic of trains, I want to turn to a big challenge that I was not aware of until I spoke to your your council colleague, Colin Best and president of AMO mm -hmm. last, literally, one year ago in July of 2023, I spoke to him on for the show. And this train hub depot is literally in your backyard. Your ward is where this train depot is going. I want to get an update from where it was last year because the town of Milton uh, requested a, a stopping juncture of the creation of this because it would shut down a main uh, road that was a big crossing for a lot of residents in the town of Milton. Uh, where does this project stand today and is are you, as the local regional councillor, happy with the pace that things are going to resolve this issue that benefits everyone? Um, the word happy and the location of CN Intermodal can never go together. I can tell you that right now. And it can never go together for me, obvious for obvious reasons, or residents of Ward 4 or Milton or Halton. But also for anybody, anybody who works at that location. Fact of the matter is um, CN bought this area and pieces of land under numbered companies uh, many years ago, I would say a decade ago. And, and after that, as soon as Britannia Road expansion, which is the, the road that this abuts to, uh, was announced by the region, it was revealed to us that this is actually CN land, and then the, they intend to build a CN intermodal there. Of course, this left all of us in shock, and I would say great anger as well, because this area is zoned residential, it has 12 current and future schools there. Um, it has upwards of 35,000 current and future residents there. It has a hospital there. And of course, the education village is right off of Britannia onto Tremaine. So 
all of that in one kilometer proximity of this proposed location. It absolutely does not belong there. And it is one of the biggest challenges Milton is facing. I know you asked about the current situation. Well, in the March of this year, the federal court declared that the liberal government's decision to approve this intermodal with albeit 200 plus um, conditions was wrong because the ministry did not consider the adverse health effects of this intermodal, which includes air quality, which includes noise pollution, um, and any other thing you can imagine that comes with having um, 1,600 trucks going in and out of your local roads every day. And after that, which was a big win for us after so many years fighting this case, after that, unfortunately, not only did the federal, not only did the CN appeal that decision of federal court, but so did the ministry and the federal government. It is a shame and a disgrace that a government that um, that thinks that it is justified in calling itself a pro-environment government, a, a government that supports sustainability and and community health would in fact appeal the federal court's decision um, and would completely discard, disregard the effects of this intermodal on human health, on the health of Miltonians, um, Canadians, um, health of our current youth and our future generations. Um, and so that is that is where we are right now. Um, the federal court has appealed, the federal government has appealed that decision the hearing was scheduled to be uh, on the 18th of this month. Uh, unfortunately, it was postponed because one of their lawyers had diarrhea, um, which funny enough is a health concern. Uh, and uh, now the hearing is on the 28th, which is today. And uh, we'll see what happens there. I'll be listening. Okay. so. I'm going to ask a political question right now. And uh, you said you were prepared for those potentially. So I'm going to play yeah. in the sandbox. What do you say to the people say, who would accuse you of saying you're just upset because it's in your backyard? You are the nimbyism when it comes to this intermodal, because I can imagine you have heard that from other places or even CN. You're just upset that it's in your backyard. So what would you say to those who say the counselor is just stopping development because she doesn't like that it's happening in her backyard? <laughs> um. I, I laugh because <laughs> you did. <laughs> just like, yeah, I laugh at these. I, I laugh at these really wishy-washy um, comments coming from the other side. Is because we have never, we have never said that we don't, uh, we don't uh, need intermodals. We have never said that intermodals are not productive. Uh, it is the federal court that decided that they are serious human health concerns if and should this intermodal come in an area which is zoned residential and 35,000 residents are supposed to live here. Um, it is not NIMBYism. It is basically us exposing the true face of a corporation that thinks it is above all municipal and provincial laws it can shut down local streets without any permission from the town or the province. It thinks that it is above all federal laws and nothing applies to it. It's its own private fiefdom and uh, can do whatever they want and can get a, get, a, get away with whatever the heck they're doing. Uh, unfortunately, um, I'm not going to back down. The more pushback I get from this organization, the more I will go forward with my advocacy against it. Um, I have been going to all the local and high, all the elementary and high schools in my ward to uh, make sure our younger generation, the youth who will be most affected by the harmful health effects of this intermodal to educate them. And I've been very well received. The youth are very motivated. And I will continue this work 
until I have visited every single elementary school, every single high school, every single private school, anywhere where youth are there, I will be there letting them know that this is their fight and that we all need to work together to stop this really harmful, located, harmfully located uh, intermodal in our community. There are industrially zoned areas in every community where CN is welcome to go to. They know it will be, you know, least path of resistance. Um, check out the Brampton intermodal. It's, it's located appropriately. Go stand there for two seconds. I kid you not, you will be putting your fingers in your ears. That's how loud it is, how dusty it is. And how, uh, and but that's an intermodal for you. That's how intermodals are. We all need our Amazon packages. I cannot survive without my Amazon packages, but we need the trains. We need the logistics. It's just the location. And it's definitely not a NIMBY sentiment. It is uh, a core decided decision that this does not belong here. So last question on this before we turn to, because I just realized what time it is and I'm cautious of time. So hopefully have an extra few minutes for, for us, uh, counselor. Um, uh, what's a positive resolution for the town of Milton? Because I'm, this is a hypothetical question. If the court comes back today, which is June 28th, as of recording this 2024, if the court comes back today and says, nope, the federal government's right, what what's a positive resolution then for the uh, town of Milton for yourself? Or is the fight then going to move to another level of jurisdiction, potentially even the Supreme Court? Yes, of course. I mean, we have been fully invested in this fight for, what, eight years now? And uh, uh, this is not the time to step back or give up. This is the time to push forward even harder. And that's what we plan to do, the region and, and the town of Milton. That is the plan. Um, and uh, the federal government, I would caution them on deciding to approve this. Uh, the federal government's polls are already down in the dumps. The federal government has a low hanging fruit here in Milton that it can easily use to utilize the safety of the seat in Milton and to make sure that their MP gets reelected. Unfortunately, if they ignore this opportunity, they will uh, make sure that the polls um, are correct. I said it better myself. Um, I want to flip the original question on its head a second, and I want to go back to asking about the challenges, but talk about what are you proud of? When it comes to the town of Milton, what is the one thing that you look at and you say, you know what, we have our challenges, which every municipality does, but th this is what I'm proud of when it comes to Milton. I'm very proud of, first of all, you know, our mayor likes to say there's two kinds of people in this world, those who are Miltonians and those who want to be Miltonians. And I completely agree. <laughs> Good old Gord. You can, see, <laughs> you can see those two people on your screens right now. <laughs> wow. If I, if I may be so bold, Chris. Um, <laughs> but uh, having said that, listen, there is so much good that has been done in Milton. And that is the reason why um, new Canadians, old Canadians, young families continue to come to Milton, continue to make this forever home uh, where they can just drive in two minutes to our beautiful escarpment. 70% of Milton is escarpment and protected green zones, just so you know. And uh, it's going nowhere. It's always going to be there. And it's just such a breath of fresh air to be able to have all the amenities of life, your grocery stores, your gas stations, whatever you need, your hospital, but then also two minutes away, you've got the beautiful escarpment. So I would say one of the most proudest things for me um, to shout out about is, is how we preserved our escarpment and our green spaces. And I think we've done a fantastic job of that. Um, I'm also very proud of our velodrome that is also in my ward. I'm very proud of it because it is international level. We have international cycling um, tours, international cycling competitions and tournaments in Milton, and we attract a huge cycling community here. 
I'm also proud of the diversity we have on council. Um, we have lots of councils in Halton region. Milton is the most diverse council. We have a very good representation of what Milton actually looks like, and that makes me very, very proud. We had two female councillors in the last council, uh, and this council we have three. We have added another wonderful colleague, um, and we had two people of color um, uh, in the last council. Now we have three. So we have done really well, and I see it only getting better and better that way. Um, I love the fact that we have planned our community very appropriately. I mean, the question of how tall the buildings should be will always be very, very controversial. Uh, but having said that, we have put density where it belongs. It's on gateways. It's on nodes. Uh, that's where it belongs. And now that we are beefing up our efforts to have transit match this density, and, and these heights, uh, I think we are well on our way to success. Thank you for that. And I love that. And I can imagine Colin, yourself, Adil, who's been on the show, and even uh, Gordon, who's been on the show, all would love me to be a Miltonian. And I fell in love with it when I was there. But I'm coming back to Milton this summer. I'm literally going to be there probably in about a month and a half from when we record this and a month from when this airs. Um, I've heard about some of the great tourism spots from your fellow counselors and your mayor, but for you, what are your favorite tourism spots that you tell people that if you come to Milton, you need to go see this? What is, what are those for you? <laughs> well, it could be anything. It could be one of our most amazing restaurants that I love to go to, or it could be our downtown farmer's market. I love the market. The flowers are the cheapest anywhere. So if you want to buy flowers, go to our farmer's market. Um, and uh, also, of course, I love hiking. So I go for a lot of hikes um, and I go to all of the great hiking trails we have in our conservation areas. That is a must, must see. Uh, we also have really good, when it snows well, skiing here. Uh, but when it doesn't snow, of course, um, that's another story. Uh, but we are growing, and as we grow, we continue to attract many, many good things. Um, one of the most long-standing um, stores we have here is called La Rose. Uh, if you are into European goods and things that you cannot find anywhere else, a visit to La Rose is key if you want, you know, that British jam you used to get or, or, or that unique chocolate that you only found in Dubai. La Rose is the place to go to. Uh, we have our own um, uh, hot sauce franchise. Check that out. It's at the farmer's market and you will love it. We have our own popcorn um, and uh, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, you should check that out too. We have a wonderful, wonderful um, tractor pulling competition, which happens every fall. <laughs> so... Uh, check all of these local Milton only attractions. We have a really good uh, blacksmith shop that is from uh, a, a long time ago. And uh, they, we still have blacksmiths take, doing classes there and teaching the younger generation. Uh, definitely have to check it out. It's in the downtown area as well. We have beautiful churches that have been very well preserved, St. Paul's and Grace Anglican Church, uh, Knox Presbyterian Church, check out the churches out. So it's wonderful now we're adding a lot of diverse uh, food options, a lot of biryani places, a lot of shawarma places. We have the wonderful Pascalinos downtown, which is just high end Italian. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a romantic date with your loved one, um, that is the place to go to. Um, and yeah, any other questions about where we should go to Milton to do what, just email me, samira.ali at milton.ca. I'll hook you up. Uh, I, I really look, I enjoy uh, connecting people uh, and places. Well, I'm looking forward to getting back to Milton. And yes, I'm going to have to find uh, Milton hot sauce and Milton yes. popcorn because my husband loves popcorn. And I, if I don't bring popcorn back with me, he will be very upset. So I will need to find popcorn and try to find a way to make it not be stale by the time I get back to Calgary. So there we go. That's my challenge over the summer. <laughs> 
I love popcorn to our family. In our family, uh, a serving size of a popcorn is measured by handfuls. <laughs> um, I want to <laughs> ask the last million dollar question because I'm cautious of time here and it's the important one. So we started by talking about yourself on the show. We're talking now about the town of Milton. And it's a question I think every municipal leader needs to know how to answer. And I think they do, but it's always great to hear it from them. So, Councillor, in your opinion, what makes the town of Milton, and let's even go broader if you want, but as a regional councillor, the region of Halton, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Thank you, Chris. Um, our town offers a perfect mix of urban and rural and country living and old town, small town feel. And that is what brought me and my husband here nine years ago. And we chose to move here and raise our four children uh, in this lovely community. Uh, Milton um, has everything you would want as a growing family, as a new Canadian, as a long time old Canadian, as a veteran. We have a wonderful thriving legion where you will feel very, very welcome. We have a wonderful new immigrant community welcome center where you would feel very welcome. Uh, you will see yourself in your elected officials. Your children will be able to resonate and relate to elected officials because they see the same color on the table. They see the same religion, the race on the table. And I think that is very important for any growing community to have that inclusion, to have that diversity. Uh, we have our uh, Orange Crosswalk to, to commemorate the truth and reconciliation efforts of our community, of our Indigenous peoples. We have um, the Rainbow Crosswalks to make sure that everybody who comes to Milton feels welcome. Everybody feels that they have the rights uh, to live, work, and play here with all of their charter-given rights. And uh, we also... Um, Milton also prides itself in making sure we preserve what we have and we celebrate what is new. And that's what makes Milton uh, the, the best place to live, work, and play. And I just can't wait to see what the future looks like for Milton with 50% of our, our, of our population being young people, 19 and under. Uh, the future of Milton is very bright. It certainly sounds like it, and it certainly is with you around that council table, Councillor. I want to truly thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day to sit down with me and talk about Milton, but also talk about yourself and have a true conversation. This is why the show started, to was to have these conversations and get out from behind social media. So I appreciate yeah. you taking this journey with me and having a conversation about a thing that we I think we're mutually fond over, and that is municipal governance and municipal politics. So thank you so much, Councillor, for doing this. You're most welcome, Chris. And please, um, and this is off, of course, the interview part is over. So this is just me and you chatting. Oh, um, oh hold on two seconds, uh, if that's the case. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up. And when we return in September for our Season 7 launch from Tofino to Torbay, from Whitehorse to Windsor, we have got you covered with great conversations with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. If you can, consider backing the show. This show could not happen without the support that you provide. If you can, head over to the crossborderinterviews.ca website and hit the support the show page now. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, the link is in the show notes. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.